Well, I'd like to welcome you all here uh, this afternoon. My name is Peter Ahn. I'm Professor of Islam in the Religion Department. Uh, I'm Director of the Middle East Institute, and I'm Dean of one of the undergraduate colleges, uh, the School of General Studies. Uh, and I have the privilege of introducing our panelists today. Uh, the moderator for the evening is a wonderful close friend, and I'm delighted that we had an excuse to get her back to the campus. Uh, Dr. Lisa Anderson is currently the provost of the American University in Cairo, a post she has held since 2008. But she still remains the James T. Shotwell Professor of International Relations here at Columbia, and is in fact the former Dean of the School of International Affairs in which this event is taking place. Prior to being Dean, she was Chair of the Department of Political Science, served as Director of the Middle East Institute, and before joining Columbia, uh, she was an assistant professor at Harvard. Uh, Lisa Anderson is the author of a number of books, her most recent, Pursuing Truth, Exercising Power, Social Science, and Public Policy in the 21st Century, which received absolutely superb reviews. And Lisa and I have known each other for more years than either of us will it's admit. Been alive. Exactly. <laughs> and we we began a, a relationship in the worst Arabic class ever given on the planet at a Harvard University. Uh, but it was so memorable that we've never forgotten each other. Okay. Uh, our panelists are a, a distinguished group with varied backgrounds that will contribute, really, I think, enormously to the discussion. Uh, Hisham Mathar was born here in New York City, but uh, his family moved when he was a young child, uh, first to Tripoli in Libya and then to Cairo. Uh, he eventually uh, went to boarding school in uh, the UK and has remained in London ever since. His first novel, In the Country of Men, was published in 2006, was shortlisted for the Mann Booker Prize, the Guardian First Book Award, and the National Book Critics Circle Award in the US. It won six international literary awards, including the Commonwealth Writers Prize Best First Book Award for Europe and South Asia, the Royal Society, Society of Liter Literature Ondace Prize, and the inaugural Arab American Book Award. It's been translated into 28 languages. Mansour al Kihya is chair of the Department of Political Science and Geography at the University of Texas, San Antonio. Dr. al Kihya is also a columnist and is the author of Libya's Qaddafi, The Politics of Contradiction. His published works on Libyan politics and human rights in the Middle East are uh, extraordinarily broadly read and very influential. He's testified before the US Congress, the European Parliament, specialized United Nations committees, as well as American, Canadian, and European government agencies. Last but not least is Ali Ahmida, who is chair of political science and Lutke chair of liberal arts and science at the University of New England. His specialty is political theory, comparative politics, and historical sociology. His scholarship focuses on power, agency, and anti-colonial resistance in North Africa, especially in modern Libya. He is the author of The Making of Modern Libya, State Formation, Colonization and Resistance, Forgotten Voices, Power and Agency in Colonial and Post-Colonial Libya, and Post-Orientalism, Critical Reviews in North African Social and Cultural History. And finally, I want to thank, uh, really very seriously, uh, the young man whose brainchild this was, and who put it together single-handedly in absolutely meticulous fashion. 
Uh, Yusuf Assad is a senior at Columbia, and I'm proud to say at the School of General Studies, the college that I run. He is a uh, major in the newly named department, if I get it right, if I get it wrong correctly, Middle East, South Asian, and African studies. It used to be just Middle East and all right. So. <laughs> uh, and we hope he will be graduating this May, if not soon after. Uh, and uh, really, we owe him a great debt. This is a wonderful topic. We. Uh, in a sense, do not do enough uh, on Libya and its place uh, within the Arab world and more broadly, especially as it goes through uh, uh, a renaissance. So let me introduce Yusuf, we'll say a couple of words, and we will begin. Thank you, Dr. Ron, and good afternoon. I would like to thank you all for joining us today. I would also like to thank the Middle East Institute, the Department of Middle East, South Asian, and African Studies, the Institute of African Studies, and for, for their sponsorship of this event. Many people have been instrumental in making this possible. I would briefly like to thank Professors Peter On, Rashid Khaledi, Bashir Abomeni, Mamadou Diouf, and Sudip Kavraj. And from the Middle East Institute, I would like to thank Astrid Benedict, and Merlin Paul Jejut. Of course, none of this would have been possible without our moderator, Lisa Anderson, who was willing to meet with a curious undergraduate and point him in the direction of Libyan studies. So thank you, Dr. Anderson. Most of all, I would like to thank our panelists for their patience in coordinating this event through their writing. They breathe life into the discourse of modern Libya. As a modern state, Libya has been described as a rogue state, a failed state, a rentier state, a state sponsor of terror, a kingdom, and a state of the masses. The list, of course, continues. Libya's experience with modernity, like many other post-colonial nations, has been characterized by a series of socio-political shocks. Italian colonization alone decimated the population to such a degree that the population remained largely unchanged between 1911 and 1950. The discovery of significant oil reserves in the 1950s catapulted a nation from being an exporter of scrap metal left over from World War II to being, the largest, to being one of the largest exporters of petroleum in the world. Today, Libya has the largest proven oil reserves in the entire African continent and is ranked ninth overall in its proven oil reserves in the world. Despite its vast endowment of resources, Libya's social, political, and economic development have often, have often taken a back seat to other more complex challenges. As an American student of Libyan descent, much of my academic experience has been concerned with the formation of the Libyan state, its history, its culture. Although there is a great deal that has been written in the field of Arab and Islamic studies, a field that has grown exponentially in the last 10 years, it can be difficult to hone in on the topic of Libya. Much of the pre-state literature about Libya was born out of the Orientalist canon. Social anthropologists serving as military or political officers attempted to decipher segments of Libya's resistance against Italian occupation through a tribal structure. They simultaneously argued against the horrors of Italian colonization while searching for their own clients to install. Scholarship of the state era during the period of Libya's constitutional monarchy has yet to receive much attention. After 1969, as the nation took a larger role on the world stage, scholarship has li on Libya has drifted, drifted towards a focus mostly on Libya's foreign policy. One can search the internet and read the Atlantic Council's policy recommendations regarding the next steps for the United States and Libya, while such recommendations are vital in fostering deep and productive interstate relations. Policy recommendations due to institutional constraints can generalize theories that lack a fully contextual perspective. In organizing this panel, I realized that a crucial perspective was omitted from the body of work devoted on Libya. 
the, con the contextual perspective of Libyan intellectuals. I have found knowledge gaps that as a student I was unable to account for. In the chasm between policy-driven scholarship, Orientalist and post-Orientalist perspectives, a sense of what Libya was and is for Libyans themselves has yet to be fully articulated. I believe we must take a closer look at the sociological determinants of the major political and economic shifts in Libya's history. Are natural resources India a curse? And if so, how insurmountable are they as obstacles to stable development? As we begin our discussion, we ask you cons to consider what is omitted from the field of scholarship on Libya and what Libyans think. One way of gauging that is accessing a range of Libyan intellectual opinion and analysis. This panel embodies this spirit. The approaches of our panelists are as diverse as they are committed to making sense of Libya today. We hope that out of this discussion may rise opportunities for the critical production of knowledge required in the burgeoning study of Libya. Thank you and welcome. Um, I'd like to hand things over to our moderator, Dr. Anderson, to get us started. Thank you very much, and I want to echo um, Peter On's thanks to you, Yusuf, for having put this together. For me, this is an exceptional treat, um, an opportunity to see some old friends and, and as you will shortly hear, um, a new friend as well, I hope. Um, tw the 20th century was exceptionally cruel to Libya, and I think Yusuf is not wrong to suggest that this is something that was true in some other parts of the world. The experience of imper European imperialism was difficult for many countries, but I think um, the entire 20th century was, as I said, unusually cruel and difficult um, for Libya. And I think a lot of what we struggle with now in both trying to think about Libya's future and, in fact, even finding the Libyan intellectuals to whom Yusuf referred um, can be attributed to the difficulties that the country faced over the course of that century. Um, and I say that thinking, in fact, that the 19th century was an interesting and, and um, actually engaging century um, in Libya uh, with a lot of interesting development and potential. Um, so it's all the more difficult to look at that of the last century, um, given how much potential there was at the beginning. Um, so I hope we spend some time thinking about what the 21st century may promise. Um, perhaps we really are at the beginning of turning around um, a history that is, has been unfair to nearly everyone who has lived in the country. Um, I'm delighted to, to be able to, in a sense, um, indulge in this conversation tonight, and it will be a conversation. We will have three presentations from each of the panelists and then a, a fairly relaxed discussion among them and with you about the, their sense of the <coughs> challenges and prospects for the country. Um, two of them, um, Ali and Mansour, I have known for a very long time. Uh, we have been in the trenches in trying to understand Libya for a long time, and it's been a joy, and I commend their work to all of you. Hashem, by contrast, is a new um, acquaintance. I've read In the Country of Men twice, um, and I have to compliment you not only on the book itself, but on um, which I also commend to all of you. But it's it's um, takes place at precisely the time that I was doing my res first research in Libya um, in the late 1970s. And it takes place in precisely the neighborhood of Tripoli where I was living. And I promise you, this is exactly what it was like. So I really, I, it's just an amazing book. Um, so if I'm not going to, I don't want to say if you only read one thing about Libya, it should be Hesham's book, but because I have two people who have written wonderful things about Libya. Um, but any of this you will profit from and uh, enjoy. 
On that note, I think I want to turn the, the um, microphone over to um, Ali first, and we'll just go down the, the panel, and um, then we will start a conversation. Thanks very much. I would like to thank Yusuf for uh, his energy and his determination to put this uh, panel together. I would like also to uh, thank the Middle East Institute. It's a pleasure to be here in the big city, coming from the countryside in Maine, and uh, uh, seeing um, uh, the wonderful New York City, and also good to see uh, Lisa and get to know Hisham, and see um, Mansoor as well. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you. This is may maybe my um, third time here at Columbia. Um, I, what I would like to share with you um, is um, um, something related to my uh, research and especially um, the project that I have been involved in the last 10 years. And it has to do with a mi missing link despite Lisa's pioneering work and other people's work earlier, uh, which is how the burden of history uh, or the um, um, bloody and brutal 20th century has been ignored. Uh, and, and there is so much silence about it uh, to the point that um, it's, it's, it's shocking, especially in a scholarly community. So I hope to share with you um, a presentation, and uh, forgive me for bringing uh, some pictures, and some of them are very gruesome, because that probably will um, bring us to see the larger context of contemporary politics. I haven't written much about contemporary politics. I started my work on um, uh, the colonial period due to family and, and um, personal um, influences on me as a young child. And I got stuck with the colonial period until now. Uh, the, the good side about that is um, it has been good to me because I, um, I kind of deepened my understanding and I became uh, uh, an area that's flourishing. And once again, thanks to Lisa's pioneering work that started a very sophisticated work on Libya and Tunisia. But it looks like Tunisia was forgotten and uh, most of the interest on, on Lisa's work has been on Libya. Uh, anyway, what I would like to share with you, um, uh, something related to my work on uh, Libya's colonial history. And uh, in the process, I would like to see if I can present to you why the burden of history is important uh, to all of us in understanding contemporary Libya. That the present is really um, uh, is, the, is related to um, the past, and the past is really the history of the present. And the, uh, what I would like to focus on is how Libya's colonial past has been viewed, and what's really the struggle, political and scholarly, on understanding that past. In 2005, I published a book, and I called it um, Forgotten Voices. And the reason for that, this is a young woman, uh, a worker um, in the uh, city of Tripoli in 1960 in a tobacco uh, factory in, in Tripoli. First generation in her family, and you could see that she still wears the Libyan traditional dress there. And it looks in a complex way. I love that look, and I decided that would be the cover of it. Why I call the book Forgetting Voices? Because uh, the fact that there is a silence, I thought, about certain aspect of Libya's colonial history when it comes to uh, Italian colonization and especially the fascist colonization of Libya. Now, 
let me share with you a little bit of um, some quotes to drive the point, to, to explain what do I mean by silence. The image of Italian fascism when compared with um, German Nazism is, is always being looked in a different way. There is a nasty case and there is really the lesser evil or the benign one. Um, and uh, if you l I looked at the literature after that and began to understand that with the few exceptions, the story has been really presented or um, absent from scholarship. Uh, for example, um, Mr. Berlusconi referred to uh, um, the fascist dictatorship in, in such a way. Uh, my great and beloved Hannah Arendt, whom I uh, like and admire until this day, um, she said that um, the fascist dictatorship <coughs> in Italy was really just dictatorship, it had nothing to do um, with uh, much of, of the na nastiness of the Nazi. Despite the fact she was pioneering in her um, scholarship about the connection between uh, um, the European colonization, especially in the Congo, and um, the, um, uh, the Holocaust and the um, genocidal state in Germany later on. I think the only way I could explain her, because I, I, I'm very biased to her, she didn't know much about the Libyan case. And I think um, she, even though she tackled theoretically sophisticated way, a lot of these aspects, she thought that was just a dictatorship. Now I found some letters that indicate that the intention, it's not just an accident of war, uh, General uh, Badelio um, wrote to General Graziani in 1930, that's really, if it takes uh, to uh, exterminate the whole population of, of, of Cyrenaica, be it. This is uh, the voice of progress and we have to do it. And then of course, if you allow the, um, the native people to uh, tell us about how they experience colonization, uh, they tell us a different story. And um, the uh, Jewish Italian uh, journalist, um, Eric Salerno, um, in his pioneer um, book about genocide in Libya, he um, interviewed some, some of the survivors and the story is um, uh, one of the, the interned uh, people, he said, we had come to 50 bo dead bodies uh, were taken from the concentration camps for burial every day. Now, questions to guide us, so will not be open-ended, and I think it might be a good idea to uh, keep that in mind, is um, what does the dominant image of um, the colonization, Italian fascism specifically, as a benign um, um, experience persist in the media? Why it you know, persists in the media and the scholarly studies? And what are the, some of the moral and the scholarly flaws of this myth of Italian fascism? And how the, the, the recovered um, oral history and, and other sources um, uh, could tell us about that kind of representation? This is, of course, to give you an idea about um, uh, Libya, as you can see. It's a very, very huge, big country in terms of size, the fourth largest country. And um, it's, um, it, it has a very in interesting geopolitical uh, um, um, position in the whole Mediterranean and Africa. And this is, of course, a modern map of Libya. And um, they have my birthplace there, Wadan, which I insist for my students um, in any geography quiz, unless they know that, they're going to flunk the exam. Uh, so uh, it's there, and I'm delighted. This is uh, very important to me. Um, there were 5,000 people when I was born there, so let's not um, uh, lose sight of that. Uh, now, uh, some of the argument I, th I think that would be related to this, this um, uh, question uh, of representation. Um, you know, the debunking the the the, uh, the lesser evil model is very important, uh, but also challenging nationalism. I in the last twenty years I began to challenge not only um, the colonial model on knowledge and categories, but also I think nationalism we have to take it also as critically. And this is something um, um, of sort of um, evaluating my own upbringing and my own um, uh, you know um, uh, ideas when I was growing up in Libya. Uh, in, in general, that you know, um, uh, challenging the colonial scholarship also requires challenging the today's national scholarship as well. And uh, the, the, the last point of my argument uh, about the burden of history is I, I think it's no longer possible for us in the 21st century to uh, see things in isolation, to think of, of Europe or Italian fascism 
um, in isolation without looking at what happened in the colonies will be um, myopic. And, and vice versa, understanding Libyan and, and, and Egyptian and, and North African and African experience without looking at Europe will be also myopic. So um, uh, the idea of to say uh, scholarship in isolation in area studies to me is really now, um, I think need to be uh, re-examined at least without being um, you know, um, competent about that. Now, um, colonial scholarship is, uh, I'm gonna divide it into three sections, colonial scholarship, Eurocentric scholarship, and national scholarship. Now, as, uh, the, um, going back to uh, colonial scholarship is, uh, up until 1970, Italian scholars did not deal with the, um, uh, with the, with the example of the camps, <coughs> absolutely. Only in the, in the, and after the 1970s, some scholars began to deal with that. Eurocentric, Eurocentric scholarship, uh, the, the idea of Bravagenti, for example, Angelo Del Bocca has a wonderful book that I recommend to all of you, uh, with the idea that, you know, this is the, the Nazi, uh, the German who are, who are the Nazi ones. Italians are good people, nice people. They don't do these things. But also the media and the denial in Italy, in Italy has been really overwhelming. I didn't know that, and I think with my visits and my um, immerse in Italian scholarship, I began to say something has to be explained. Why silence? Why silence? And uh, your scientific scholarship is related to what I made, uh, said earlier, is that the idea that uh, you look at um, uh, these colonial experiences from the lenses and the assumptions and the choices of European modernizing uh, colonization, which I think a lot of people have challenged that before. The, the rational scholarship, especially in Libya, has really grappled with that in various ways. Just to give you an example, the, the battle is still raging today um, within the state and also outside the state where everybody wants to see uh, themselves as the true representative of the uh, heroes of um, the anti-colonial resistance. And uh, scholarship will be published outside Libya. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, one of the leaders of the Tripolitania Republic, uh, the son of Abdel Nabi Belkhir, published his father's memoirs in Tunisia, and you ask a Tunisian scholar to write that. Uh, the, um, uh, the, um, one of the other leaders of the Tripolitania Republic, uh, the late um, Sheikh Tahir Zawi, was in exile in Egypt. And also today, uh, uh, the, the, the scholarship on, 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 on contemporary Libya has to do uh, with appropriating the uh, colonial period to fit the state, uh, current state in Libya and its own uh, you know, um, uh, historiography. Now, the alternative scholarship you have, um, it's not so bleak. There are people who were aware of the connections um, uh, that I'm talking about. Antonio Gramsci, in his uh, present um, um, uh, notebooks, uh, he wrote about that. Post-colonial intellectuals, Ebe Cesar, uh, Franz Fanon, Samir Amin, and uh, Colombia's Mahmoud Namdani wrote about that very much and the connection between the two. Uh, now, the late um, uh, British anthropologist and um, officer E. e. Evans Pritchard um, wrote about detailed um, analysis of, of, of the, um, uh, what happened in the camps and, and the brutal colonization in Libya. Uh, but uh, it also, uh, as Lisa once reviewed the book, uh, it was slanted. It was also for other purposes to, uh, uh, you know, uh, legitimize the new regime in Egypt. Uh, now, Lisa, uh, in her uh, you know, um, dissertation and book that was published um, really was aware of the atrocities and her uh, writing, and she has spoken about that. That's most important, and also in her presentation, and, and always brought the fact that Libyan colonization, Libyan's experience with colonization is not like any other, is probably uh, one of the most brutal and, 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 and savage experiences uh, that um, uh, decimated the population, uh, maybe half of it. Uh, in the first half of the 20th century, and to understand Libyans today, really, we have to understand them. They might sound very, very crazy, er erratic, um, emotional. That's not because of biological reasons, because also um, uh, the, the fact that this colonization was, uh, indeed, with the exception of Algeria and the Congo, and maybe Hurrio people in Namibia, is one of the most, um, 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 one of the worst uh, examples. Now, in Italy, uh, there are uh, some scholars who really courageously refuse 
to uh, let the silence go. And I want to point out to you uh, that the work of uh, uh, Giorgio Rochat, Angelo Del Bocca, a, a journalist by Alex Salerno, uh, my colleague N uh, Nicola Labanca, and um, also um, NYU, uh, a colleague of mine by the name, historian by the name of Ruth Bingayat, who uh, also um, has been very, very uh, um, um, courageous in challenging this image. Um, now, what I'm talking about, so you will be in the picture, I'm talking about the internment of between, we know that the minimal number 80,000 to some of us think 120,000 uh, total population of civilian Serenaika, and uh, how they were interned between 1929 and 1933 in these camps, Turiya, Silub, Sidi Hamad al-Magroon, Lebrega, and Da'gela. Da'gela will be the equivalent of, of the Ashwitz of, of the Libyan internment, the worst camp of all. And every year in the last eight years, I have been going to these camps, uh, visiting um, the cemeteries, trying to um, uh, interview the survivors. And they began, after one year, to talk to me. So now I call them, I interview them, and I go back and interview more. I have only limited time before many of them will pass away. But what happened is that the silence of the archives, which is um, either destroyed or uh, denied by uh, the Italian authorities, uh, will be um, a counter uh, by uh, listening to survivors and I had to learn all the methods, all the techniques of oral history, and especially our um, rich Libyan cultural production of a Shar Shabi or folk poetry. Uh, I haven't finished my, my work. I'm up to 150 interviews, so I hope that I'll stop maybe by, um, by next year and start writing the finding of, of the... Um, um. Now, I also, uh, I want to uh, share with you out of the 100 or 115, um, or maybe at least 100,000 people, including children and elderly, only half of them came out. And they didn't gas them. The Italians did not gas them. They starved them, and they did not treat them. So many of them died of trust and hunger and diseases. Um, and uh, the, the, the most striking, the most heartbreaking scene was going to see the cemeteries. The cemeteries um, uh, were uh, just horrific to me. Now, uh, if we allow the subaltern or the, those ordinary people to speak to us, and if we allow them agency, then probably we'll listen to a different narrative that we will not find in the archives. And I think um, I found some memoirs like uh, uh, by Ibrahim al-Ghmari, I found uh, also the Libyan Study Center in Tripoli gave me all the collected material, around 20 volumes, and I had to sift through them to find the material related to the camps. And I discovered that the most important record is the folk poetry. And folk poetry, especially that was composed during internment. And um, some of them are memorized by Libyans, like uh, the, the one by Figi Rajab Bahwish al Nifi and Umar Khair, the poet of. Each uh, camp had a number of uh, poets who wrote and composed poems during internment. And the University of Benghazi published two collections uh, of, 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 of um, poetry that was crucial. But also, I found um, more recorded ones. And this uh, folk poetry is a unique cultural production for um, uh, Libyan people, uh, people who don't read and write, but they will compose poetry. And it's a, it's a fascinating record. And by the way, there are many female poets. And uh, I, put, I put some of these um, poems in my book, Forgotten Voices. And uh, my dear friend, uh, Khaled Mutawa, um, um, uh, translated Fakhir Rijab Wahwesh al Minifi's epic poem, which I think the most devastating poem um, that you read about the horrors of um, colonialism and fascism. Now, this is a little biography of Fakhir uh, Rijab Wahwesh al Minifi. Uh, the poet who will outlast fascism because the poem is almost 20 uh, long pages and it's going to be available in my new book in full uh, English translation so you know, English uh, uh, readers will be uh, avail you know, uh, able to read uh, his background. I'm trying to find a, a photo uh, uh, but I have failed for the last five years 
I'm very, very determined. I'm usually, I don't give up. Sometimes I wait 15 years. And uh, I don't know if I'll be rewarded, but I'm still trying to find a photo of, uh, of uh, Fidirja. Now, the oral uh, tradition or the oral history uh, uh, tell us about all these um, um, items, deportation, daily life, food and clothes, forced labor, illness, trauma, and death. And I try to um, collect as much as I can. And um, the stories, some of them are in my book. Some are now I'm um, adding um, more material on them. These are pictures of the camps that we found in the archives I want to share with you. Um, they, by the way, that what they did, they um, marched um, thousands of the civilian population or put them in ships from um, uh, uh, the Jabal al-Akhdar and uh, the other parts of Srinaika or Barqa to the desert of Sirt. And uh, there, this is an aerial picture of Al-Abyar um, um, camp. These are pictures of people who were hanged uh, during the, uh, uh, you know, the invasion I found in the archives. And this is a picture of uh, a mass grave. This is um, a horrific picture of uh, one of the um, massacres there. And you could see people who are completely naked. It uh, really reminded me of a lot of pictures of, uh, of uh, the German Nazi there. And these are some of the people I have been um, um, uh, seeing and visiting every year. Um, that's in an Agela camp. Uh, I met with them there with a friend of mine, uh, Dr. Abdullah Ibrahim. And um, they were all interned in the camp as, teen, uh, as early teens. And they began to tell us about it. This is one of them. This is the son of uh, one of the commanders, sub-commanders of Umar al-Mukhtar. Uh, and um, uh, his name is Muhammad Uthman al-Shami. And he has the most remarkable memory. He is almost 80 uh, something. And his memory is, in, uh, you know, uh, it will um, rival any, any uh, young man. I still call him every Eid. Uh, to greet him, and I see him in Benghazi every year. He gave me details, and he often gave me a surprise. He drew a map out of his imagination of the Aguila camp. Its location, its, its uh, you know where they were sit, everything, and he drew it from his own imagination, and it's a remarkable one. Um, uh, this is in one of my other visits to uh, Sulug. And I met with, um, uh, with some of the survivors. This is uh, one of the survivors and his son in the background. I was there uh, talking with him. And uh, it was a fun uh, interview, but he made a lot of, uh, made fun of my hat and my sneakers uh, there. <laughs> and uh, uh, I deserve that. No because, feel yes, 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 yes. <laughs> and this is uh, in um, Leitaniya, also outside Benghazi. I went there. There was a morning, and they, um, uh, they said, you know, we have um, somebody died. But then he said, you know, professor, you came all the way from America. I can't let you go without interviewing you. So we took a corner, and we, we had a two hours interview about um, his internment, his memory of the internment. This is in, um, in another um, uh, um, uh, village called al Mlitaniya, also in uh, the eastern uh, rural Srinaika. And we went there, and um, uh, this is Hajj Abdul Majid Abd Rabba Al Agaibi. And um, uh, he, uh, his memory was. He was a very grumpy old man, and he kept um, uh, shouting at me, and, uh, but I got what I want from him that day. Um, these are two of my uh, colleagues from the University of Benghazi History Department, Professor Atiyah Makhzoum and Professor uh, uh, Abdullah Ibrahim, who uh, facilitated uh, the, this visit. This is a remarkable lady. She is the daughter, I think, uh, probably Lisa will remember her name, uh, the, fa uh, the name of her father. She is the daughter of a great commander, um, of the Awagir um, um, uh, Gorilla Door. Uh, Abdullah Gajja is her father. Gujja. Abdullah Gujja means Gujja because his hair was very bushy and, and it goes this way. She said that but people made fun of him, so they called him, you know, the one with the uh, hair that stands like this. Uh, and uh, she, uh, to my shock, she lived in Sabha where my father lives now. And um, she was in good health, very, sh very, very sharp. And uh, she um, told me about her father. And uh, that was a nice surprise. I also got uh, some of her father's papers that time. Now, this is a horrific, this is the head of um, Bumatari, 
in, in, in Al Kufra, where the uh, Mussolini's, I mean, Agrestiani's <coughs> troops, after they defeated the resistance, they severed his head. These are horrific pictures. Uh, that's from colonial Libya. Uh, I'm sorry to uh, spoil your afternoon, but I want you to see that. So um, uh, you'll put the idea of benign colonialism to rest, maybe. Um, and you will see um, some of the horrors of that period. This is, of course, you are aware of that. This is uh, the, the capture of the legendary leader, Amal al-Mukhtar, and the trial, um, also part of the process of the trial. And um, the conclusion, uh, let me conclude, since we really have limited time, and I could address some of aspect of my research about the burden of history in Libya, or the colonial history, is um, what we have now, the colonial uh, past of Libya is really represented by conflicting point of views, um, official ones and scholarly ones. We still have the reproduction of colonial um, scholarship, representing uh, the colonial past, uh, Libya's past, as uh, hard but also modernizing. The Eurocentric <coughs> point of view that doesn't see much about that, just a phase in uh, the process of um, understanding Europe as a certain point. And national scholarship that tried during um, uh, the, um, the 40s, the, uh, during the Sanusi monarchy, and after 1969, to push different agendas and different legitimizing uh, uh, a view of history. And um, uh, being aware of, of, of who is producing what kind of knowledge and what kind of representation will allow us to understand that, um, that the nature of the struggle over Libya's colonial past. The, um, I think my own take is really to look at history from the bottom up, to look at the subaltern, to look at the, the ordinary groups, uh, women, slaves, servants, um, ordinary people, um, uh, uh, and how they view these processes and, and pressures in them. And um, I think we all will benefit from pressuring the Italian state to release uh, and open the, um, the files on the archives. And uh, this is a crusade I have been leading for uh, at least 15 years, and I have been kicked out of the Italian archives once. But I think I'm gonna still going to be a thorn in their, in their side until probably I retire, or even after I retire. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, uh, I think I'm no longer, I think, interested in, in just a story about how terrible uh, is colonial uh, burden or colonial history. I think if we want to go beyond colonialism and nationalism, we want to see also the commonalities, not only the differences, the commonalities that bridge the divide between uh, people uh, in Europe and also in, in Northern Africa and the United States and, and that region. That will not happen without debunking stereotypes and representations. That will not happen without going beyond uh, leaders and elites and states and try to reach uh, the uh, societies. And, and understand their specificity, but also discover their commonalities. And by appreciating that Libyan people, when they look crazy to us, when they look at us very angry, they are not really biologically um, 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 deficient, but actually <laughs> they very, very natural reaction against uh, the, what they, their grandparents and the, what their parents and the stories they have been told um, in, in dealing with uh, the 20th century and the 21st century. I'll stop here, and I'm sorry for taking uh, a little bit too long. And the last thing I would like to say to you, this is, there is a biographical of note. This is me in the sixth grade in Sabha, <laughs> uh, when I had a, more hair than now. And uh, um, uh, both grandparents were active in the uh, you know, anti-colonial resistance, and um, grandmother who had family interned. So I had also a biographical personal note. That's not to uh, make it personal, but I didn't choose this topic out of just scholarly interest. It was also to give them justice and find the truth about what happened in the 20th century. Thank you. Ali, thank you very much. I can't tell you how um, heartening it is to see the revival of the kind of scholarly networks that we hoped would develop decades ago, and I think the kind of work you're doing is exactly work that probably should have been done long ago, but it's wonderful to see it happening now. This is a story that needs to be told. Um, so thank you again. Mansoor, the floor is yours. Oh, you want me to go next? Yes, I do want you to go next. That's fine. <laughs> I, I, what I will do, what I'll, do I'll, I'll, I'll pick up where, where he left off, okay? Uh, 
the, the Italian experience was not very pleasant. The truth is, it wasn't. Because by the time they left, Libya was emerged as the poorest country in the world. Uh, literacy rate was close to 99.6%. Infant mortality rate was 40%. Per capita income was less than $100. And I tell you my own personal experience in this. Uh, my first school was not an Arabic school because there were no teachers. Italians were interested in teaching Libyans only how to read an envelope so they can deliver one place to another. No Libyans were allowed to go beyond the third, second or third grade education. And so there were no teachers. When I was born, when I grew up, I, didn't have, I could not go to an elementary school because there were no teachers to teach. And so I had to go to a, unfortunately, well, fortunately, well, unfortunately, depending where you are, um, I had to go to the Dominican nuns. In the mornings, I had to go to the nuns, and they tried desperately to Christianize me. In the afternoon, my parents sent me to the, to the Qutab, the Islamic. So, so you can imagine this schizophrenia here. In the morning, the Dils Benedict had based on Christian Dominic and Nostrum, and the afternoon, Allah, la ilaha illahu al qayyum. This is nuts. But it, that, was, that was life. That was life. Life was very, very tough, particularly in Saranika. Saranika bore the brunt of this. The, the, the decline in population was phenomenal. The poverty. The, the, the lack, of, lack of infrastructure. Benghazi, big, perhaps the biggest city in Saronika, had holes from shells from the, in, in, in buildings until 1965. Uh, it, 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 was, it was a horrendous, a horrible, horrible, horrible time. In fact, so much so that really no country in the world wanted to assume responsibility for Libya. And the only reason why the United Nations took it is because of the bipolar relations between the United States and the Soviet Union, that you find the United States, I'll take it, and then and they didn't know what to do with it. So they said, we'll make it independent, and we'll give it, we'll give it independence and make it into a different state. And they were made into a state, true. But did it have the basics of, of being a state? In all honesty, no. And it toppled along. On, on, on aid from here, aid from the US, selling it, uh, territory in form of bases, rents, and that's how it survived. It survived until discovery of oil in 1958. And once oil discovered, was discovered, you find a fundamental change taking place. But unfortunately, the change didn't last so very long, because from 58 into 69, not much. Some changes did take place. Some infrastructure was, 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 was done. A little bit of, 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 uh, of uh, release of the pressure was, was done, but it, not very much. In 1969, when Mr. Gaddafi came to power, you would think that he learned from the history what this gentleman has been telling us about. But unfortunately, that was not. Apparently, he didn't read Arndt or didn't read uh, uh, any of the, of the theorists of uh, Gramsci. Or, he read Nasser. And Nasser's vision for Egypt was really quite different okay, from that for Libya. Proved to be the guiding path for Libyan development. So if we look at the Libyan economy, we see really that it passed through a number of phases. But first of all, you have to understand that Libya was not endowed with anything except perhaps a nice coastline, 1,700 kilometers of coastline. 98% uh, of the country is desert. And how big is the country? The country is about two and a half times the size of Texas, maybe a little just a bit larger than Alaska. And yet, really, much of the country was desert. Of, of that, I mean, if, you, if you think about it, approximately only 1%, 1.03% of the total land mass is arable. Continuous production of food is on 0.19% of the land. I mean, I think the total was maybe <coughs> 4,700 square kilometers or something like that. This is really arable land that is used. But much of the country is not. And has always, and has always 
depended on importation of food since becoming independent. Now in Arabic, the term is Libya. And it's funny when you write Libya, because you can write Libya in Arabic from right to left or from left to right. The same thing. Why is that? It's not a coincidence when you really think about that. <laughs> we, uh, it's not a coincidence. We talk, I talked, uh, Lisa and I were, were, on, the, were on a history channel and I made this point. You know, if you were coming to Egypt, there is no reason for you to stay in Libya. Just get on right with Tunisia. There's green, there's water. And if you're coming from Tunisia, you didn't stay in Libya. You went along to Egypt. If you're in Libya, there had to be something that kept you there. Okay, and I think we poor Libyans enjoy Libya too much. We enjoy the destitution, we enjoy, we enjoy it the way it is. But we've never really had the future and the peace of mind, at least those my age and on, that we really deserve. Because we, we fell into this pit of dictatorship that has I, 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 there's no, I can't find a proper term to describe to you. Okay. If I can just, if I can just, in, in words, and I'm looking at my notes over here, I, I look at the pre-Gaddafi era, and I refer to it as bare survival. It was, it was characterized by destitution, later oil, and a little bit of progress. In the post-Gaddafi era, we first of all saw rapid progress, very rapid. From 1969 to 1974, we, know, we saw phenomenal change in living lives. Little bit of little government intervention, a lot of development, a lot of infrastructure development building. But that came to an abrupt stop in 1974. And idiosyncrasy was involved. And that idiosyncrasy continued from 74 to 78. And I'll explain just this period briefly as I, as I speak to you. Okay. Followed by another period, just following my notes and I'll come back to it. What I call, referred to from 78 to 2004, I call it a period of economic suicide. And from 2004 on to today, it's a period of catching up. Now, you have to understand, we look at Dubai, Abu Dhabi, and we see a new Disneyland being formed. Phenomenal development, phenomenal production, phenomenal growth. When Benghazi, well, forget Benghazi, when Tripoli was a city, beautiful city, with shops, with infrastructure, with streets, with, with the stadiums, movie theaters, okay. beautiful corniche on, on the sea, promenades, sailing clubs. Dubai and Abu Dhabi were two huts and a barn. I promise you that. Okay. They, were, they, were, they were 50 years behind Libya. And Libya was 50 years behind Egypt, behind Cairo. Okay. But still, if you compare it today, Abu Dhabi and Dubai is 100 years ahead of Libya. Opportunity that was missed, an opportunity when, particularly after 73, when a flood of oil and cash and money provided the regime with a once in a lifetime chance to actually instigate and bring about a fundamental change in the Libyan economy that would be hard to, to, to shake. But that was not the purpose. The purpose there, after that period of time, was ideological formulations, if you like, that took place at the expense of the economy. Today, the regime says it wants to catch up. It wants to institute a market economy. It wants to bring about a fundamental change you know, the way I see it and the way I've studied it, maybe I'm wrong. But I know a market economy requires three things. 
If you don't have them, you can't have a market economy. The first of those things that we require is that economic activity must, in large part, be conducted by a private sector. There's room for state intervention, no doubt about that, but a minimal role for state intervention. So that's the first thing. The second thing to make a market economy happen is you have to have respect for private property. If you don't have respect for private property, why would anyone want to invest? Makes no sense. And the third thing <laughs> to make it happen is respect for contracts. What I want to ask you is where does Libya fit on these three? In 1974, a process of nationalization of private property began with Article Number 4 of the law, where well, the government decided that, well, we'll take it over. Not yours. That was made much worse in 1978, when the second stage began. And the second stage began by legalizing theft, public theft. Anyone can go into someone else's property, home, land, business, and take it over. And there's absolutely nothing you can do about it. Nothing. Companies were taken over by the state. And the state says, well, you really can't have a company. You no longer you have to have, uh, 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 you have to have a, 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 a Ishtiraki, not ishtiraki, uh, tasharukiya, which basically means a, 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 I wouldn't say a collectivist, but it, I guess it is. Co -op. A co well, something like a co-op. There, co there are rules for co-op, but it's not even a co-op. Okay? <laughs> co it's, not, it's not a co-op. Uh, uh, you own it, but you don't. Okay. You own your home, but you don't. I run the state, but I don't. And we live in this, in this vacuum of, of laws without any laws. I mean, there are, there are no formal laws. They're informal. There are informal ones, but there are no formal ones. And it's very difficult to bring about any change in this constant environment of basically or the list change. You can't, you, can't, you can't direct it in any way. And so I look and I see today the regime wants to bring about a fundamental change in the economic structure of the society. OK, we want to bring in companies to build for us. We want to do this and do that. I look and I see, well, the new, the new Dubai. Libya opens its doors for business. California company has just decided that it, it actually got it got a an 80 billion dollar for building 100 160,000 housing units for 80 billion dollars. Uh, you know, to me, to me, this is this is this is exactly what the rentier economy is all about. The rentier state is all about. We don't trust Libyans to build. We'll bring a company to make it for you. They can go to the company and go, and you do nothing. The problem is very much so today in Libya, where you have unemployment that is really, really very prevalent. It would be, for the last 10 years, I've seen unemployment at 30%. I, I don't believe that. This is one. I don't believe any of the statistics that actually come up from the state. Because my experience and what I see is that individuals are hard pressed to find work. They can't find work. On the cultural level and social level, and it's making it even more difficult that, and, and it's really funny, what, what you, because you ask me here, well, what measurements do you use? What do you have? You know, I'll tell you what I use. Uh, something struck, struck me. What struck me a great deal was the fact that all of a sudden 
I, I witness and I, and I hear my wife tells me and, and so forth. But young girls, 20 and 21 years old girls, marrying 40 and 50, 50 year old men. And I said, what's going on? What's going on? But when, when it once, twice, three times, four times, I understand. But when you start hearing this going on and on and on, I ask, what's going on? And so I decided to follow it, follow through and see what's going on. The truth is what's happening is that young men and women are not able to find a job. So they can't open a home. They, can't, they cannot start a life. And women want to get married because unfortunately in Libyan society, this is the way it is, you know? And they get married to older men as opposed to men their own age. Because men at that age tend to be better secured than younger individuals who can hardly find jobs to make ends meet. And I looked at the, 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 the pay structure. And the pay structure within Libya is dismal, it's poor. 200 Libyan pounds, 250 pounds, that's what they get. I mean, I know individuals, managers of companies, 200 pounds, which is approximately $200. Now, the exchange rate today is, is one, one dollar for one pound for 1.25, what is it, over on? It's one, it's one pound, 1.25 to, to the dollar, 1.25 to the dollar, okay? It was at one time three pounds to the dollar, not anymore, it just changed dramatically. And so I see that what is really happening is that the opportunity for young people to provide and work and, and actually excel and be productive is declining. Is declining. And therefore, many actually leave government business to try to find some jobs elsewhere. But there, that becomes very difficult as well, too. So, so where is this going to go? Where is this heading? Okay. I don't know. The truth is, I don't know where the Libyan economy is going. Idiosyncrasy of the leadership is making it very difficult to move in any direction. With the economy today is really dominated to a large extent by a clique, a small clique, that is unwilling to experiment or change or allow for the opening up of the economy in any direction. Many of those actually have risen with the regime, and they're part of the regime. And so you have one strata, and I was talking earlier with Yusuf about this, you have one strata on the top, okay, and that's really made up by the revolutionary committees, because it's in their hands what goes where, how, do what, who's responsible, who's accountable. They're not accountable, but there's one strata. And you have the bottom strata, which is the people's committees, and, and they belong to Mr. Shab al-Am, or the so-called parliament, if you have like that, okay, that really aspire to move on that level. Now, yet at the top, totally, it's totally dominated by Mr. Gaddafi himself and the close familiar allies. The economy itself is divided into sectors today. Each one of Mr. Gaddafi's children is responsible for one sector. And nothing can happen in that sector without the approval of one of the children. So I still, the question comes back in, what is going to happen? What do you expect to happen? Another oligarchy comparable to what we had in Russia? I don't know, perhaps. But will the economy make the jump from what we see today into a, a, a market economy? I highly doubt it. Because first of all, the major obstacle to that change itself is Mr. Gaddafi himself. Moving into a market economy would provide centers of power with influence and resources that he would not be able to control. And therefore, that's not going to happen. Ultimately, what you really must understand is Gaddafi and Libya's Gaddafi is a state of dictatorship. Instead of dictatorships, some can be benign, some be malignant. In this case, the truth is, 
Libya has passed through 40 years of malignancy. And it's very, very difficult. It's very difficult to get out of that unless Mr. Gaddafi is willing to relinquish that hope. Let me stop here for a second. Thank you very much. <laughs> it is remarkable the extent to which the um, Libyan regime, once one of the world's most notorious pariahs, has been completely restored without a change in regime, <laughs> um, something we will undoubtedly want to return to. But first, Hisham. Thank you. Lisa, may I, is it okay if I stand? Please stand, whatever you'd like. I, I hope you don't mind me standing, but I, I, uh, I, um, I'm not a very good, um, I'm not very good on chairs. I, I just feel, <laughs> and also this sort of, you know, the long table with the cloth always, I have almost kind of like a phobia because they remind me of the revolutionary committees, and, um, um, but yeah, of course, you know, I'm, 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 I am honored to be sharing it. Um, <coughs> with such uh, wonderful and uh, bright people. I, I'm, I, I am a writer, so I'm very much out of, and this is not my, you know, I, you know the university is a place that I, I, I feel um, a stranger in. So, but, 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 so, so I'm a little bit um, out of my depth, but I am, I am uh, indebted really to, to all the organizers and for their warm welcome. Um, the, the only other thing I'm going to say is that I, I have this cough, so if, if I start coughing, um, don't worry. And, uh, <laughs> if I start wheezing, don't panic. If I collapse, give it five seconds before you. Okay, well, firstly, I would like to thank Columbia University and in particular the Middle East Institute for hosting this event for their invitation and for their generous and thoughtful hospitality. This conference was the brainchild of Yusuf Asad, as we already know, of course, an American student at Columbia who has Libyan origins. It was his idea that we should all meet here today and discuss within the liberal walls of this university, Libya. He has worked tirelessly over the past few months to make it happen. If we ever needed cause for optimism about Libya, then surely the passion, intelligence, and love of justice of this distant son ought to give us strength. Nine months ago, Yusuf sent me a letter in which he articulated how in the American university system there is very little academic work devoted to the study of Libya, and now he wanted to try and how he wanted to try to go some way in rectifying this. Today he has achieved an important step towards this goal, and for this I thank him. Also in this regard I would like to thank Assistant Professor Bashir Awamanna for his support of this project from right from the beginning. I'm pleased also and frankly honored uh, to be sharing the podium with Dr. Lisa Anderson, uh, of whom I've been a, a big fan. Uh, Dr. Ali Hameda, who I haven't met before and, and enjoyed having breakfast with him uh, this morning and look forward to reading his work. Uh, and Dr. Mansour al Kikhia, who I, I've sent, I've only about, sent about three fan letters in my life, and one of them was uh, to, to Mansour when I first read his book. Uh, it was a, a, a wonderful encounter, and it's uh, really uh, great to be sharing this event with him. Uh, I am going to speak about the Libyan writer, but I thought before I do that, just because I feel, I mean, I, I feel slightly guilty uh, for, you know, subjecting you all to <laughs> how awful Libya is. I mean, already, I mean, I feel miserable right now, so <laughs> listening to all this stuff. It's, um, so, you know, I don't have a happy story. And what I'm going to say about the Libyan uh, writer is, in kind of an abstract sense, the Libyan writer is, is uh, is not necessarily a happy story. So I thought perhaps I'll read something short from my book uh, in the country of men 
that is, uh, I hope you'd find amusing. Um, so the, the protagonist, who is also the narrator of the book, is a, uh, an adult recalling uh, this particular summer when he was nine years old in Tripoli. Um, and his name is Suleiman. Particularly in summer, when the sun swelled with heat, the whole world went to sleep. Children, adults, even dogs found a patch of shade to slumber in. I never learned how to nap. It always felt strange to get into my pajamas at three in the afternoon. It reminded me of being ill. Instead, I would search the neighboring building plots for things I liked or thought useful, things that used to be knives or parts of old radios, and took them to our garden. There, I scraped glue that was always oozing out of the joints of the glue tree, got whatever wood I could find, and carrying everything in the wrap of my arms, I climbed the straight flight of stairs up to, my, uh, up to the flat roof. The roof tiles were baking. You could see the heat rippling above them. I had forgotten my sandals, so I hopped, running for the shadow made by the water tank, to my workshop. I rubbed my feet on the coolness of the shaded tiles. I looked up at the sun. I thought how strong the sun is, how mighty, and felt frightened by it, by the possibility of it not moving or coming closer, pressing down against us like a giant balloon. I remembered my Quran teacher, Sheikh Mustafa's story of the bridge to paradise, the bridge that crosses hell eternal to deliver the faithful to paradise. We all will have to cross it someday, and some of us won't make it. Those will fall into the fires below, the fires that call for them. What a sight it will be. The heat, the screaming, there is bound to be screaming the flames licking the sides of the bridge, making the handrails, Sheikh Mustafa said nothing about handrails, but there are bound to be handrails, hot to the touch. The heat will reach some of us faster than others, Sheikh Mustafa said, because for some, the heat, the fires of hell themselves will be like a voice calling. I suppose it's like when, you're, when you hear your name and you can't help but turn to the source that spoke it. Some of us will be longing for hell eternal, God forbid, the way we long to respond, to obey when our name is called, even by someone we have never met before, or by a teacher who has asked a question we know we can't answer. We raise our head and say, yes, and if he can't see us, we reach higher and shout, over here, sir, when we know there'll be nothing to do except curl our lip and shrug our shoulders. Because the fire calls for the fire. Sheikh Mustafa warned me about this. He said, you must try to ignore the heat, Suleiman. When you are on the bridge to paradise, you must keep your eyes focused on paradise and the beauty of paradise. And whatever you do, don't look down. <laughs> Watching the heat ripple off the tiles on the roof, I thought I should, rain, uh, I should train myself for that day. I decided to walk, not hop, not run, but walk, in a line as straight as an arrow, without even arching the soles of my feet, back to the staircase. The staircase was to be my paradise. The first step didn't feel as bad as I expected, but after a few steps, the soles of my feet were on fire, and I found myself hopping and running, wondering if hopping and running were allowed on the bridge to paradise. <laughs> my cough also means that I have to drink hideous quantities of water. You know what that means. <laughs> um, right, so I'm going to try to say something comprehensible about um, the Libyan writer. And as so much as one can speak about such a complex figure, such a vague and fragile and nearly ephemeral figure. For Libyan literature has been dealt so many blows 
that it now seems to tremble at the edge of oblivion. It is a lit literature that has for too long been subjected to political interference, and an interference that has developed so many ways to undermine the imagination, for if dictatorship is to exist, it exists against the imagination. It cannot tolerate variance or contemplation, and therefore it cannot tolerate spontaneity or dreaming. Dictatorship is violently jealous, and in the words of the late Reziard Kapuscinski, every dictatorship not only surrounds itself with kitsch, it is in itself a vulgar political kitsch, unhappy, often stained with blood. It is the triumph of kitsch, not the harmless, containable kitsch of mass culture, but an aggressive kitsch, which ruins the creative culture, poisons the social atmosphere, and, 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 and has only hatred and contempt for the individual. But before I speak in such direct terms, I would like first to talk about two events that took place in the latter half of the 20th century that although um, have nothing to do with Libya, say something, I believe, about the existential pull and thrust between politics and literature. In 1945, shortly after liberation, a charismatic French general manages to convince an award-winning French author to be his Minister of Information. Approximately 45 years later, an, in an internationally acclaimed Peruvian novelist puts his pen down to run for office. Although wholly unconnected, these two events share a detail that is telling and curious in its mirror likeness. General Charles de Gaulle had been trying for some time to convince the reluctant André Malraux, a man 11 years his junior, to take on the job of minister. He used the guilt argument. Your country needs you. He used flattery. You are the best man for the job. And I'm sure de Gaulle also used the mildly threatening argument of so much would be lost if you were to turn this down. Every tactic failed. It wasn't until all three were employed with equal skill and fine balance that the general succeeded. That night, victorious, de Gaulle tiptoed into his marital bedroom and woke up Yvonne de Gaulle. Yvonne turned on the lamp beside her bed and squinted at the figure of her husband unbuttoning his military jacket. <laughs> I imagine the large brass buttons eased out of the slits with more willingness than usual. He apologized for waking her up. Where have you been, she said. Tonight, he told her. Then perhaps here he paused, or perhaps he went on straight on, speaking the words quickly. Tonight, I assassinated André Malraux. <laughs> By this time, Malraux had published La Condition Humaine, published in English under the title Man's Fate, a novel about the existential plight of a diverse group of people after a failed revolution. He had also written L'Espoir, published in English under the title Man's Hope, about the Spanish Civil War, another historical drama that the fated Malraux had played uh, a significant role in, fighting on the side of the Republican forces, and indeed setting up the legendary um, Esquadron Espana, uh, which had inflicted serious losses on, onto Franco's nationalist army. André Malraux ended up serving de Gaulle until the end of the general's presidency in 1969 first as Minister of Information, then as Minister of State, and finally as the mi first Minister of Cultural Affairs. In a different continent, and about 20 years after Malraux retired from public life, the 54-year-old Peruvian novelist Mario Vargas Llosa, already noted for novels such as The Time of the Hero, Conversation in the Cathedral, and The War of the End of the World, was running for the presidency of, per of Peru. Late one night, he too walks into his marital bedroom and silhouetted by the light, begins to unbutton his dinner jacket, waking his wife, Patricia Yosa. Like Yvonne, 
Patricia, too, turned on the lamp beside her bed and squinted toward her husband. But she did not ask, where have you been? She knew he was in a political rally. His combed hair and his shoulders were sprinkled with confetti. No, Patricia did not need to ask where Mario had been. All she said was, once. And perhaps here too she paused. Once. I was married to a novelist. Many writers distrusted Yosa after his running for office. Not only because in the neoliberal not, not only because of the neoliberal platform in which he ran, which many Latin American, Asian, African and Arab intellectuals saw as betraying the struggle for self-determination and social justice. It wasn't that, I would argue, that turned their hearts. They distrusted him because they doubted his commitment to literature. They doubted his faith. And although André Malraux's political career is seen under a more favorable light, it too caused some readers to shy away from his work for a time. The novelist must never be louder than his work. If he shouts, he must shout in prose. If he is a whisperer, then he must do that too in art and keep silent outside the page. He must surrender his goods and his ambition and his motives and his causes and his hang-ups at the door. He must let literature set the agenda and the challenges. He must serve her. Should he be foolish enough to demand that literature serves him, then he risks the integrity of his work. Such a novelist is like a man who embraces his beloved whilst picturing another woman. Every novelist makes these decisions privately and sometimes without his complete knowledge. Yet everything depends on this question of fidelity to art. I remember when I was writing In the Country of Men, a novel set in Libya and in which the constant and menacing gaze of the dictatorship pierces its way through the private quarters of a family's daily life, I often felt the temptation to expose the awfulness, the sheer absurdity and vileness of the Libyan dictatorship more nakedly. A dictatorship that stole our house, a dictatorship that incarcerated members of my family and several friends, a dictatorship that killed people I know, people I love, people I admire. So, you can see, I had many reasons to make my book an attack, a catalog of their crimes. I had to resist this temptation. And on the other extreme, when I was gripped with a sense of panic, fearing retribution against me or worse, members of my family, as indeed has happened to others who spoke out in the past, the temptation to act as my own censor, in other words, my own oppressor, was also great. I tried to resist that too. If I succeeded in protecting my work from such extra literary concerns, then I did it because I was somehow convinced that to give in to these temptations, regardless of the legitimacy of my grievances, would turn a work of fiction into a diatribe, a dead corpse. For any writer caught amid such tides, literature must be his measure. His prose will show him up. In the prose of any work of literature, one finds the very DNA of the entire thing, right there in the sentences, sometimes in the first sentence. A writer who thinks he can fool language will be made a fool of by language. Language's main purpose is to betray us. Every word we utter betrays us, says a little more than what we think we are saying, reveals more than we have anticipated. Exposes us, exposes us further. And if a writer's intention is to use literature for his own ends, then all the evidence will be on the page, regardless how hard he tries to hide his footsteps. Yosa and Malraux knew this, although at certain points in their lives they felt it important that they should devote themselves to public life. Both were too good and too honest to allow this to contaminate their work. This is their virtue, but also a possibility granted to them by their environments. 
they were allowed to be both artists and citizens, to be selflessly committed to their craft, but also critically, but also to critically engage with the current issues of their time. In Kano Gaddafi's Libya, this possibility is not permitted. The dictatorship sees literature as a threat and therefore has repeatedly treated writers as enemies of the state. Actually, just as a as a side, uh, as an aside, uh, I, I I think I might be I think I think I might be uh, correct in in, in in this observation. I think all of our books are banned in Libya. I think. So, yes. you know, I know your, your books are, but you, so, so so it's a you know this is just a. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I got great satisfaction when a friend smuggled some in. It was fantastic. It's great. You know, it's a sort of, uh, you know, the book, uh, the book returns. The book is, the book, you know, says on somebody's, you know, on the floor of someone's car or something. It's fantastic. Um, well, hopefully somewhere nicer than that. But um, <laughs> the regime has persistently attempted to acquire the Libyan author to possess him, and ultimately to possess language and the national narrative. This, more than anything else, I believe, has determined and limited contemporary Libyan writing. Since Gaddafi's coup in 1969, the fickle leader had, in the space of nine years, changed the colors of the national flag twice, redesigned the national currency in order to trick people into handing over their cash, and exhausted the goodwill of the public that had originally welcomed this new Republican era. The new regime now penetrated every sphere of civic life. It implanted its agents, the so-called revolutionary committees, so you see my allergy to <laughs> revolutionary committees, who were obsessed with finding enemies in every institution and organization, every club and union, in the lecture halls and the theaters, corrupting the society's cultural vibrancy, a vibrancy that burnt brightly in the 60s and even into the 70s. They subjugated the press dismantled one of the most progressive and independent university student unions in the post-colonial Arab world, executed its leaders in public squares and imprisoning hundreds of its members. Society was chased deeper indoors until the only place Libyans could exist unmonitored was inside their homes. But even that finally, that, but even that final um, private domain was invaded by regular broadcast, uh, by regularly broadcast interrogations of those the revolutionary committees deemed anti-revolutionary or traitors or bourgeois or backward people who were halting the march on national television. For their si from their sitting rooms, Libyans watched men stiff with fear under a camera's harsh lights, answering questions delivered by faceless voices. They watched summary executions in football stadiums, men hanging by the neck, swinging by a rope in the middle of basketball courts and public squares. Fear killed many poems. Fear killed many novels. Fear was like thorns in the mouth. Writers had been imprisoned, killed, their fingers sliced off. The 1970s and 80s saw the worst of these attacks. But that wasn't enough. Books, too, had to be destroyed. The army was ordered to pay a visit to every bookshop and library in Tripoli, armed with a long list of titles to be confiscated. Thousands of books, from Dostoevsky to you know, Faulkner, everybody, um, were set on fire in one of the public squares. All that remained um, on the shelves of the startled booksellers' shops were educational or revolutionary books. And so began a process familiar among dictatorships everywhere, the rewriting of history, the redefining of the present, and the singular vision of the future. Propaganda films were aired showing the horror of Italy's occupation, followed immediately by a victorious Gaddafi punching the air with his fist. As if World War II never happened, as if it was not Montgomery and the British Eighth Army who defeated Mussolini in North Africa in 1943, as if King Idris never ruled Libya until 69 or had ever existed. History rewritten, reality suspended. Perhaps, dictatorship, perhaps dictatorships fear literature because they see it 
as a competing narrative. Dictatorship is a sort of hideous fiction in itself, intolerant of the very idea that there might exist more than one possibility, the very idea of other fictions. The story of Libyan literature is also an edible one, not edible, but audible, Oedipus. Um, yeah, it's, it's a difficult word, no? Because it does sound like an edible. It's not, certainly not an edible. Uh. <laughs> it is the story of fathers and sons, the story of sons against fathers and fathers against sons. For the dictator is the distrustful, jealous, and controlling father. He breathes down the necks of his children. He examines every part of their anatomy. He wants forever to live in their skin, be constant on their tongues, and for their eyes to be reminded always of his image. Why else the endless posters? This is why this eternal relationship, with all of its complexities and extremities, is, has obsessed my fiction thus far. Gaddafi's political and Oedipal war on literature has been effective but it can never succeed by virtue of the fact that literature is not a plant one can uproot, but a vapor, as agile as oxygen. It is by nature rebellious, resists control, and will never be satisfied. No prizes, no praise, no success, and no torture or burning of books or closure of universities could ever kill it. It is in every one, it is in, in every one of us, including those who have never read a book, those who do not know how to read. It's, the clutter, it's in the cluttering tongues and the poetic ones. It is wild and searching, and it finds opportunity everywhere. This is its genius. And here, I would like to end with a small anecdote concerning a Libyan blogger, let us call him X, who was recently imprisoned and tortured for his writing. For two years, he pretended to be insane. For two years, he spoke out loud to himself, made up stories, characters, wizards. At times he was the wizard, or an old childless lady, or a lady with children who had left home, or an old man with a broken leg, a man who had lost his money, a man who had just found his money, then another man who believed he was a bird. X was many people during these two years, but never himself. Then finally, when the prosecutor arrived, X ran in circles around him, asking, would you like a Pepsi Cola? Perhaps you would like a Pepsi Cola. He was released. On the way home, he stopped at the first internet cafe and published a list of all the critically ill prisoners he knew of in prison. Just a list. Not because anything would change but because he could not bear the insanity of silence. A year later, when the authorities caught on to the fact that X was never mad, that he was pretending, they re-arrested him and this time took him straight to the mental asylum, where he remained for a year. When I asked him how that year was for him, he said, terrible. Then, after a long pause, he added, but I wasn't the only one who wasn't insane. <laughs> he told me of a Libyan ambassador who, due to a disagreement with Gaddafi, had been deemed insane and put in the insane asylum. I asked him if he ever returned to blogging or if the experience of torture, imprisonment, and a year in a mental asylum had not, uh, had not lost him the will to record, to write. He laughed. Of course, I'm still blogging, he said. Thanks. Thank you very much. I think the um, various of these talks have illustrated the extent to which the 21st century was a difficult one for Libya. I don't think there are that many countries where you would have this variety of panelists, almost all of whom refer to hanging corpses at various junctures in the history of the country. Um, 
I was reminded when Hisham observed that all of their books are forbidden, and I have no idea whether mine is or not, um, that when I was doing research there, there was a room in the library of the university in Benghazi that was the forbidden books room, and it's where they put them all. And the wonderful thing is that foreigners like me could sashay into that room because I didn't matter. So all of my colleagues would say, so what's in there? What's in there? Um, so there is a, always a subverting of this forbidding, as I think Hisham pointed out. There's never a real way to keep it completely forbidden. And I was struck as you were concluding by the extent to which, in some respects, your description of the Libyan writer is not dissimilar from your description of the popular poetry of the colonial period. This is a way of keeping, of, of being a witness, of keeping a record, even in the context, even in contexts in which you aren't supposed to be able to do that. Um, so at some point, I think it would be fun if we had an opportunity to talk about the, the uses of literature, of various kinds of literature in these kinds of political circumstances. Um, that said, however, I want to open the floor. I have lots and lots of things I think we could talk about, but um, if, in, if any of you have comments to each other, I'll open with that, and then we'll <coughs> open to the audience itself. 